Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. In this video, I'm going to be going over Biology High Level Paper 2, November 2015. So I'm going to start off a new series where I essentially go over a past paper in IB Bio or IB any subject, and I I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be showing you guys what goes inside my head, my thinking process as I'm trying to answer these questions and maximize my marks. So first of all, we're going to be starting off with November 2015. We're going to go over the database questions, followed by the structured factual recall, and then lastly, the extended responses. And I'm not going to be doing all the questions or doing them timely because um, I have to explain my understanding to you guys, so if I do that timed, I'd just be writing and that won't really be helpful to you. Um, but I'm even like the optional questions, like the extended responses out of the three, since I'm only asked to do two, I'll do the two that I feel are easiest. And unfortunately, I won't be doing the one that some of you may pick. But um, anyway, before that, without further ado, let's just get right into this. So first of all, the database questions. I generally like to highlight a lot. So I'm going to highlight the key terms in this um, in this paragraph, and I'll be back. Looks like in this um, paragraph or this database question is about this fish, and we have this statistic called the fork length, which just seems like to be to be the length of the fish. And I realize that there's a graph here, which shows the length of the fish in order and the frequency. So this is like a frequency distribution. So key to note is millimeters here so that's really important and also the key here is that it's autumn and winter okay so 2008 autumn 2009 winter so that's really important for some of the questions so other than last get started identify the total number of o naka with four between 240 to 245 caught in autumn 2008 and winter 2009 so 240 here and one two three four so 245 would be here right so 240 to 245 will be these two so it's going to be this um, winter 2009 plus the autumn 2008 so this one looks to me like it's 50 and then on top of the 50 we have here it looks like an eight or a nine i'm going to say nine so let's just say that's going to be, and if we look at the units, it's just the total number. It's not thousands or hundreds. So we're going to say 59 total. In this next question, we're asked to compare. So the key, com key um, command term is going to be compare. And we're told to compare autumn 2008. So these um, dark ones with the light one. So immediately, you can see from the graph above that the dark ones are situated to the left. So winter. 2009 lengths are on average higher so that's one of the first points you're going to make because you can see this like a skew here um, and also the frequencies are higher so frequencies of the amount um, oh no, I have to do that in proper notation if I'm writing a book um, are higher in the winter you can see that's why um, it's quite, the bumps are much larger in winter one. And next, another thing I would say is that winter has a smaller range than that. So normally, like it's easy to confuse this graph and I nearly did that as well. Like the, if you look at this size and this size and then say that's the larger range, but there's actually a smaller range because the measured value is actually on the x-axis. So a smaller range in winter. And autumn. So here I don't mention 2009 and 2008 and because winter and autumn you can distinguish between which ones which based on the year and um, the season. And yeah, so also if I'm saying compare, I could talk about this bit here how there's a region of um, um, there's a common region where both of them are present. So about 225 to 260. So, Okay. From 225 to 260 millimeters, there is overlap in the peaks for autumn 2008 and winter 2009. Okay, that should be um, that. That's um, a fairly straightforward answer, and we've hit more than three points. 
So I'm pretty sure that the reason I like to do that is because in case some of your um, comparisons are not valid or in the mark scheme, you at least hit some of the other ones. Right, let's move on to the next question. Suggest two factors that could affect the distribution of Orinoco in the North Pacific Ocean. Okay, so for this question, you only have to suggest, so you you just you literally have to do um just um write one thing and uh, write two things. Sorry, so just write a word each one. So first one, of course, would be food availability because um organisms need to live. They they need food to live. So um if food moves around, they're gonna move around, and also I reckon temperature for any living organisms is quite important and in oceans temperature changes a lot so temperature is another one and I can go for a third one just for um, thinking out thinking outside the box I could say just um, perhaps migration of the fish colony could work as an answer point but yeah other than that um, that's it for the question so I'll put those three um, yeah let's move on to the next question Lipid in Onaka was measured to evaluate possible differences in energy status during the first 15. Okay, so we're looking at lipids to determine energy status. Okay, so something we call energy status. And then from lipid. The graph shows the relationship between the full length and the lipid content. Okay, so this is full length lipid content. Total lipid content per gram. Okay. Um Okay, again, we have this distinguish between distinguishment before, between uh, autumn and winter. Okay, state the range of lipid content measured um, of owner car caught autumn 2008. So we're looking at the gray ones and the lipid ones. So there's two and then 14. So it'll be, um, it's going to be, is it 14? Uh, let me see. Maybe it's 13. It looks like it's 13. So 13 to um, this one is a bit like 1.5. So 13 to 1.5. So about um, 11.5 grams. Okay, since this is a one mark question, I'm not going to do the calculation. Outline any correlation between total lipid content and fork length in autumn 2008. Um, so winter 2009, I already see there's no correlation because everything's clumped sort of together. And whenever they're clumped together, you generally don't have a correlation. But here you can see sort of like an upward trend going around. So you can say for the autumn one, there could be um, a direct correlation or positive correlation. I think positive is a better word because direct correlation, you have to go through an origin. Um, suggest reasons for differences in lipid content. I think that um, one of the important things to consider is when you think about winter, food is generally less on winter, right? Less during winter, sorry. So um, if you have less food, lipid content is going to do it down. So one of the reasons I think is going to be uh, less um, available food in winter. That could be one of the reasons why the winter bit is um, uh, lower. And let's suggest another reason. I think another thing I could say is that larger fish or large, yeah, larger fish eat larger prey. So because they eat larger prey, I reckon um, that's going to cause cause them to um, accumulate more energy at one feeding session, and their bodies are going to store more lipids after the feeding session. Um, because their body has sufficient energy, but they can go for larger prey at one time. So I think that might be another reason. Um, oops. Uh, persistent organic pollutants such as polychlorinated biphenols have been shown to reach unpolluted arctic area by air currents. Okay, so these are sterile arctic areas and we have pollutants. Now what do they do? Another method of transport of these pollutants in into these ecosystems is provided by migrating Onaka. Okay, here's the fish of focus here. If the an Onaka is actually causing these um, pollutants to be transported around. Pollutant transport was identified in a population of Onaka in the Copper River, Alaska. The graph shows concentration of PCBs, okay, in muscle lipids, okay, of 
Bernanke in relation to the distance of upstream migration. Distance of upstream migration dependent variable PCV in mussels in nanograms per gram. Okay, this is really interesting. So all of a sudden we see this relationship between these weird variables. Right, so just take a look and try to understand. So we're thinking of these pollutants. And these pollutants, the concentration essentially in these of these pollutants is increasing as we have more distance upstream migration. So the further upstream that these um, Orinoco have migrated, the more um, they have, more PCBs they have. So this, um, like before reading any questions, I sort of feel like um, maybe upstream has a source of pollutants. Maybe that's why it's like that. But yeah, let's get started. Describe the relationship between the distance of upstream migration and the concentration of PCBs. There is a positive relation or correlation where as, as distance upstream increases PCB concentration increases so I'm not just stating but I'm going under the describe um, describe Kiko command term and PCB concentration increases so you got to write a bit more like a sentence of course don't write beyond the box for a one marker say the concentration of PCBs in muscle if it's at 125 kilometers from the earth um, ocean estimated by the correlation line. So even before I read this um, estimated by the correlation line part, I already knew that it's going to be, you are going to have to use the correlation line. So whenever it says to state the concentration of something while looking at uh, the dependent variable, so whenever it asks you to find the value of the independent variable, sorry, whenever it asks you to find the value of the dependent variable using the independent variable value, right, you're always going to have to use a trend line if it is provided um, so 125 this is a 125 150 okay it's going to be here we move up here it looks like we're right bang on on 1000 but remember we need nanograms per gram because we um, because we have to keep the units at hand because the units are not stated in the question above as the owner can migrate upstream they no longer feed okay this is really interesting it suggests to me that it's going to be about lipids Suggest so a reason for the relationship between distance of upstream migration and concentration of PCBs in muscle lipids. Okay, so concentration is how much there is in how much of something else. So concentration is like, concentration in chemistry is going to be like moles over volume, right? So we've got to think about it the, the same way here. We're looking at nanograms per gram. So if there's less feeding, right? Less feeding results in less building up of lipids okay so we have a lower accumulation of lipids however these PCBs from what we know they just stay in the body of these Onoka fish but they don't actually um, nothing happens to them so however the lipid the PCB amounts are unchanged so overall the uh, less time feeding the higher the PCV concentration which is why it increases further upstream okay that's going to be that and that is our database section done and now we're moving on to the short factored fra fact structured factual recall sorry yeah and let's get started the micrograph shows a cell from the root of an onion allium sepa that's kind of relevant to this question during mitosis Calculate the magnification of the image. So something I like to remember is this pyramid. So this is what I was taught um, when I first learned magnification. So there's I, A, and M. 
So what this means is the image size is equal, this i is image size, a is actual size, m is magnification. So image size equals actual size times magnification. Actual size equals image size over magnification and magnification equals image size over actual. So this pyramid is a really easy way. So if I want to work out this, I would just have to do that over that. I want to work out this, that over that. I want to work out this, multiply the two together. So magnification is I over A. So the image size is 250. Oh, sorry, um, that's the actual size. The actual size is 250 micrometers. And now i got to get a ruler and measure it out. And I'll be back. So I measured this out, and this is about three and a half centimeters. So that's going to be three. Um, that's going to be thirty-five um, millimeters, and that's also going to be equal to thirty-five thousand micrometers. So if I'm going to do this calculation, um, I'm going to get I'm going to get one hundred and forty. So that's going to be my answer for magnification. Deduce the stage of mitosis shown in the micrograph. So we recall again, mitosis is the, the division of the nucleus of a cell, and this forms two diploid cells. So the stages of mitosis are PMAT, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. So prophase, what happens is we have the um, nuclear membrane dis dissolving, the centrals moving to the side, and um, other activities like the... Um, chromosomes becoming more condensed from chromatin to chromosomes. Metaphase, we have alignment during the middle. So first of all, it can't be prophase, right? Because there's no, the, you can't see the nuclear membrane at all. It's completely gone. And um, you see two sets of chromosomes. So chromosome-like regions, you know, there are two regions. So this cannot be prophase. And it cannot be metaphase because we don't see alignment along the, uh, along the um, um, equator of the cell. And anaphase, it is quite possible because during anaphase, the continued contraction of the microtubule spindle fibers causes chromosomes to separate, chromosome, cro like double chromatid pairs, which are called one chromosome to separate and form individual chromosomes. So this could be anaphase. Now, let's just rule out telophase first. In telophase, you have the nuclear membrane reforming and the chromosomes um, uncoiling into chromatin. We can see this is quite dense. We have these black dots that are quite elongated, so we can tell that this is still in the chromosome form. So it can't be telophase either. It is definitely anaphase. So like what I did there, I could have just told you guys the answer was anaphase and explained why I thought it was, but I went through this as well so that we can do a bit of a refresher on the mitosis topic. The onion allium is an angiospermophyte. The honeybee is an arthropod. State three structural differences between the cells of an onion and honeybee. So this question, most people might get um, a bit scared when they see the angiospermophyte and arthropoda because this relates back to topic four about classification. I think it's topic four or five, where uh, I will, maybe it's five, but where you have the characteristics of um, characteristics of angiospermophyta, so the plant phylum and the animal phylum. And you might think, okay, I didn't memorize all these characteristics, I'm screwed. But no, it's much simpler here because the onion is actually a plant cell and the honeybee is an animal cell. So we just got to find those cellular differences. Remember, and it says structural differences between the cells. So you can't, you can, you generally don't have um, these phylum associated with um, specific, specific cellular characteristics. It's generally macroscopic characteristics like arthropoda segmented bodies. So anyways, our uh, difference is cell wall and no cell wall. Another difference is chloroplast, chloroplast and no chloroplast. And let's think another one, central vacuole, no central vacuole, vacuole, vacuole and no central vacuole. So can you guess which one's which? Well, this right here is the plant, so the allium, sepa, and this one is the apis, meli, mel, mellifera. Yeah, I used a bit too much space there, but you get the idea.
Uh, three structural differences for two marks, a bit of a weird question, but that means you need to get all three correct to get two marks. Say what is indicated by the presence of polyzones in a cell. Ooh, okay, so we need to remember what polyzones are. So first of all, polyzones are multiple ribosomes that are coding the same mRNA region. So what this suggests is that one mRNA strand, sorry, one mRNA strand has multiple proteins made, protein copies made, sorry, protein copies made through translation. So the mRNA strand is repeatedly, repeatedly translated. Okay, there we are. Now we're cool on that. Next question we have, label the structures indicated on the x-ray of the human elbow. This is quite simple. This is, I believe, topic, um, oh, this could be topic 11 as well. So um, this big bone on your bicep and tricep area is called the humerus. And a bit more we need to know is this is the radius, this is the ulna. So I'm going to write R, U. Um, this is the forearm. They don't have underside forearm, upper forearm distinguishing names unless we're doing um, health science. This is the bicep, this is the tricep. So um, this is quite straightforward, but this one right here, um, the region between two different segments where bones are bones are connected. We call these synovial joints. joints. So state the role of tendons. State, so just say one simple answer. Of course, to connect muscle to bone. And we have ligaments as well. Ligaments are bone to bone. Explain the role of calcium in muscle construction. Okay. Oh, one sec. I'm just gonna... Okay. Uh, role of calcium in muscle con contraction. Hmm. Okay. So we have, um, w when we start these questions about muscle contraction, um, there are many long responses on this. So there are like eight markings. We always start with the action potential because muscle contraction is something that's voluntary and that's part of the skeletal nerve, skeletal system. So we need the nerve impulse. So an action potential reaches T tubules causing calcium release by the structure we call the sarcoplasmic reticulum. This is all topic 11, I believe 11.2, 11.1, I don't remember which one was. But um, yeah, sarcoplasmic reticulum releases calcium and calcium binds to troponin causing tropo Myosin, myosin, configurational changes, changes that expose um, myosin binding sites on actin, right? So that's essentially going to be the three marks here that I'm going to try and go for. And I'm not going to be explaining the bulk load of it because like what happened here with the sign of joints, I sort of go on and on because they have to explain the whole topic. And I'll just make a video on muscle contraction later on. So just look out for that. And if I do forget, just leave me a comment as a reminder. Now, one of the stages of aerobic respiration is called the link reaction. So this is topic 8.2, I believe. And... This is in cellular respiration. So we have glycolysis, the link reaction, the Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain. All right. Label the diagram to indicate where the link reaction happens. The link reaction happens in, of course, the matrix of the mitochondria, which is this right here. So matrix. Outline the role of coenzyme A in aerobic respiration. Hmm. Coenzyme A. This question is actually quite tough, I don't know. 
I know that acetyl CoA is formed in the link reaction, so I'll just write that acetyl CoA is formed in the link reaction. Um, but I think um, this is used in Krebs cycle. Used the Krebs cycle. I generally don't recall learning much about the role of coenzyme A with anaerobic respiration. I didn't really know about that part, but uh, yeah, well, I'm just going to go over it for now. So like what I did here, even though I don't have much of an idea how to answer this question, I'm still going to have a go and sort of write, write some facts around what I'm going to say so that that way I can guarantee at least, maybe not guarantee, but I have the chance of at least a few months instead of leaving completely blank. But, so I may not get the marks, but at least I know that there's a small chance that I might. Okay, moving on. The P plant, Pisum sativum, the allele for tall plants is A, and the allele for short plants is little a. Um, the allele for green plants is, yep, yep. Determine the phenotype of AA. The B phenotype is the physical expression of a genotype, so quite easy to remember, right? pH, physical, genotype, phenotype. It's like a... Portmanteau. So uh, big A, little a, so we have a heterozygous trait, so the dominant trait is going to be expressed. So this is going to be a tall, and we have small b, small b, so homozygous recessive, so we're going to get yellow. Tall, yellow, p plant. That's going to be the phenotype, the physical expression. Compare the information that could be deduced when the genotypes are presented as a, a, um, a, a b, b, or um, this notation, this chromosome notation. So, firstly, we know that uh, we've got to think about linked chromosomes, right? This one shows like, uh, sorry, linked genes. So we have these two on the same chromosome, so these two are certainly linked, so you can tell that these are linked. But this one here, you don't really know if it's linked, so AA, BB, unlinked, but then other is linked so i'm being quite brief here but you'd obviously write a bit more than that um also so if you're going with that you can also mention that um, this one is independent assortment assortment only whereas this one can be undergo um what's it called crossing over and also no independent assortment. Next question, deduce one possible recombinant offspring of individual A, B, little a, little b after a chest cross. So these lines I forgot to mention earlier represent one chromosome. So the, on this one chromosome we have big A, big B. On chromosome we have little a, little b. So a test cross means we are combining or um, breeding with a homozygous recessive. So it's going to be AABB. That's going to be the individual we have. And recombinant offspring means that there's not going to be, um, this, it's not going to have the same traits as the parents. Not trait, I mean the genotype. So the genotype um, combination, it could, so if the parents are, let's say, both big A, big B, or little a, little b, or one could be big A, that an offspring that is big A, little b, would be um, a recombinant type because they're not, that's one of the genotypes that are not present, that's not present in the gene, in the um, parent. It's not present in either parent. When crossing over happens, we can essentially have some of these genes being ex uh, um, swapped with each other, right? Because these are homologous, non homologous, non sister homologous chromatids. And these can be exchanged. So we can have big A, little a, and um, big B. Sorry, we can have big A, little b, and A, big B. All right, that can be one of the things we have as a recombinant offspring. And also we can have a um, little a, big B, or a big A, little b. So it's the same thing, but flipped. But this is not the answer we're going to get. We have to first think about how 
What happens when we cross with this? I actually just realized that there's a much simpler method to do this question. So if you look at the fact that it's a recombinant offspring and recombinant again means that its um, genotype is not present in the parents. What we have here essentially as the parents are a um, big A, big B and little a, little b. So that means it's going to be a tall green plant or a short yellow plant. Well, if we swap one of those two, we could get a... Uh, short green plant, right? Or a tall yellow plant. So short green or even tall yellow. And that's one um, recombinant offspring because uh, I was just used to start talk, thinking about recombinants and um, um, like thinking about the genotype. But in this case, you can write the phenotype as well because it does not specify. And also, the test cross part is kind of relevant because even if you do the test cross, you just got to find one. That we're looking at the offspring itself, so it's gonna we're gonna have to look at something that's not there. So it's gonna be the short green or the tall yellow, something that's some phenotype that's not present in the parents. So it can't be tall green, so yeah, it can't be tall green or short yellow. So it could be short green or tall yellow. I mean tall yellow, yeah. All right, now moving on to section B. This is a tough part. Answer two questions. Up to two additional marks available for construction of the answers. Write your answers in the boxes provided. Okay. Draw a label diagram of a mature human pig. Okay. Let's just do which questions should I do. So there are four questions here. Um, let's just go over question 5A first. Let's do these in order. 5A. Now, a human egg cell, first of all, we got to have... Um, this question asks us to draw a little label diagram, so we're going to mention the parts there are. So first I'm just going to draw a circle, and then I'm going to draw a nucleus. I'm going to draw the cortical granules. Um, what else are there? I believe there are centrioles. Centrioles, and there's the zona pellucida. Zona pellucida is called the jelly coat as well, and this is where the um, acrosome reaction occurs, I believe. Um, and next we have the follicle cells. Follicle cells. Okay. You have drawn now the label so whenever you have a drawing um, question you can all for a cell you can always label the cytoplasm it's always easy marks and um, next we have the follicle cells uh, follicle cells in corona radiata I'm pretty sure if you just say follicle cells it won't be correct next we have the zona pellucida I believe that's how you spell it uh, but remember in biology if you miss a couple letters you won't you'll be fine this one is the cortical granules they do the really important cortical reaction and this prevents polyspermy and here we have a nucleus and i believe you have to say haploid nucleus because my teacher made a point of emphasizing that when you label these you have label gametes you have to mention haploid nucleus next of course the centrioles Centrioles are really important in mitosis, like anaphase, and they form the spindle fibers that move stuff around. So that's about six things labeled, so I reckon that'll probably be enough. But uh, have we labeled everything? No, we can label the plasma membrane. So that's another, another thing that you can um, always label. So I'm just going to color, color this, highlight this, because these are generally, as a huge tip, whenever you're um, labeling a cell, you should try and measure, label these because in IB biology, um, you may think that something is quite obvious because if it's a cell, there's obviously going to be cytoplasm, but you're still rewarded the same exact mark as knowing what the zona, zona pellucida is. So you may as well pick up the easy marks in case you can't remember this more complicated fact. Now let's move on to question 5B. So where were we? Where were we? Um, Outline a technique used for gene transfer. Okay, so a gene transfer is the movement of genetic material from one organism to another, but I'm not going to really write a definition here. 
and I'm going to first say, actually, you know what? I'll type these responses up. So when you learn about gene transfer, we always learn about plasmids because plasmids in bacteria are really easy to manipulate because we have plasmids which are just a small circle of DNA. So it's just a loop of DNA that we have to cut open. We have to cut it and insert DNA in. So when we insert the DNA in, it becomes transcribed and translated, eventually forming the proteins we desire. So plasmids are quite important. So let's say plasmids from bacteria are single loops of DNA and um, they are cut by endonucleases. The endonucleases are these restriction enzymes that are recognized base pairs and what they can do is they can actually break down um, phosphodiester bonds between the DNA chains and um, essentially cleave DNA. So it's really cool. It's, we call them the molecular scissors. And so plasmids um, are used for gene transfer such as in the case of insulin production. So you may have already learned, I think in topic, uh, topic two, I know I might be wrong, but topic two, I believe, um, insulin production is really important because insulin helps those with type, um, type 2 diabetes because then our bodies aren't producing insulin, enough insulin. So we need to have insulin as a source. And earlier, before we had um, access to gene transfer and those technologies, we had something we call a, <coughs> um, something which was just, I think it was just killing, yeah, it's, they didn't have a technical name for it, but what people do what, did was they killed a pig and took its pancreas and harvested the pancreatic insulin. This was super inefficient and required the slaughter of many pigs, but now we can just um, pump that um, insulin gene into a plasmid of a um, of a of a bacteria, and then we can produce mass amounts of insulin. So it's really nifty. Um, restriction and endonucleases nucleases cut uh, DNA strands specific location allowing the extraction of a DNA um, sequence of interest. Okay, so we can extract the DNA sequence of interest and furthermore um, plasmids, plasmid loops can be cut to Accommodate the, accommodate, wrong, accommodate the transfer of a gene from another organism. When it comes to gene transfer, I like to think of it as an arts and craft activity. We have, um, we're essentially taking something, let's say, pieces from a magazine, we're cutting it and putting it on paper, right? That analogy, you can see how it works. But one thing's missing, we're missing the glue. That's why we have something called DNA ligase. DNA ligase joins the cut strands of DNA to form a continuous strand. You may recall from topic 7.1, DNA ligase actually connects the Okazaki fragments in the, um, in the discontinuous lagging strand of DNA. So that's quite um, a good link for you to remember what ligase does. So this is essentially what gene transfer is. And moving on, we have to do part C. So this is the eight marker, this is the big one. Explain how evolution may, may happen in response to environmental change with evidence from examples. Okay, so first of all, we need to realize that this question is asking us examples of evolution. So normally in biology, you get a mark for an example, but now that this asks you for an example, we have to, we have to go for, um, we have to go for an example. So it's not optional anymore, it's mandatory. So first of all, I'm gonna talk about evolution and how it works. So there are five pillars of evolution and um, 
first of all, it's the overproduction of offspring. So I would say in nature, there tends to be an overproduction of offspring. Offspring have natural variation arising from sexual reproduction, meiosis, and what was it? There was mutations, right? Mutation cause um, natural variation. And one type of variation, when we talk about evolution as an example, and since we need an example for this question, I will talk about the peppered moths. So peppered moths in England are either black or white. So that's the variation they have. Peppered moths are a really useful example for evolution. And since more offspring are produced, there's a struggle for survival. And only the fittest survive. Fitness is based on ability to be suited towards environmental condition. Before the wait no, let's talk about after the industrial revolution. After the industrial revolution the peppered the lichens the trees on which peppered moths rested became Darker, thereby providing better camouflage for the black moths, increasing their fitness. These favorable genes become, became passed on more often, leading to a change in the gene pool of the population where the black moth became more frequent. Okay, so that's essentially the um the the black allele I would say the black allele. So, yeah. So this is essentially how I would write this eight marker. I would write a bit more for construction of essay marks, but since I am trying to do this in a video and I've just changed my mind, I think I might go over all of these extended response questions. This is just an outline of what I would write. I would write some padding words as well to keep um, structure right. Actually guys, now that I've done this part, um, extended response, um, Question number five, I realize that this video is going to be really long if I end up doing all four. So instead, I'm just going to stop on this one right here. And that's going to conclude this video. So um, although it's not a full paper two, it is still, um, it's still, I hope, so. I hope you guys still found it useful. And if you guys didn't understand any of the topics I mentioned here, please leave a comment down below. And keep in mind that I just started this series, so it's not going to be perfect at the start. And let me know. If you guys have any recommendations on how to proceed but i'll be adding these um these extended responses definitely i'm going to do my three three minute um extended response uh video so i'm just gonna um do these questions in that regard and maybe i can do a five minute video where i do the whole uh set of three questions at a time so it's kind of undecided on that but that's going to be it for the video and i hope you guys enjoyed see you later